on the elbow joint and what kind of load um, the biceps muscle produces in the case of um, this particular analysis. The next thing we started looking at is what if there is more than one muscle acting at the elbow joint. We know that typically, so the first assumption that we made that only one muscle is acting was a simplification because we know that we have only three equations uh, when you do a planar analysis and you have three and to make it three unknowns the two joint reactions and the muscle force we um, assumed only one muscle was acting. So, when you have more than one muscle acting it becomes a statically indeterminate system. So, you have more unknowns than equations and so you need to um, put some other conditions relate some of the unknowns in such a way that you can solve this system. And one of the ways to do that is to assume that the muscle force produced by a muscle is proportional to its cross sectional area. So, if I say that F m 2 by F m 1 is equal to A 2 by A 1, it is proportional to their cross sectional areas and I call that constant K to 1, then I can express F m 2 in terms of F m 1. Similarly, F m 3 in terms of M 1. So, my unknowns 3. F m 1 j x j y which I can now solve. So, the and then find f m 2 and f m 3 in 1. So, it is a fairly straightforward uh, uh, way to do that. So, instead of using the cross sectional areas I could also see maybe look at E m g activity to see which muscles are active at the C signals to the forces produced in the uh, individual muscles. So, that is one way I could relate the various muscle forces that are acting at that particular instant. So, um, the third method is to use, so this is, so one is forces muscle forces proportional to cross sectional area that is one strategy. So, strategies for an indeterminate system. Correlate muscle forces EMG signal measurements EMG basically measures the electrical activity of the muscle it does not that are in the muscle, but you can uh, tell which muscle started acting when for how long it acted etcetera. So, and the third method is to use some kind of an optimization of the an optimization uh, algorithm for this. So, you could for instance say minimize the muscle forces, what is the combination of mus a certain level or minimize the joint reactions, what combination of these muscle forces will produce the minimal joint reactions. You, you could use one or a combination of objective functions, the more of these you combine the more complex your problem is. Here we are only talking statics, but in a dynamic situation you could try to 
minimize the muscle powers over the cycle. Okay. So, because that in a sense relates to the metabolic cost of a particular activity. So, powers etcetera. because this implies that you are using minimum effort to perform the task. So, some kind of uh, a combination of this can be used for a dynamic situation. So, optimization is very commonly used. If you look at complex models, which model various muscles. It, so, the complexity of the model may mean that you are modeling closer to the actual system, but it also means that you are making other assumptions. So, it is not necessary that because whatever assumptions you make is going to determine how uh, accurate. So, for our purpose we will generally stick to our objective is just to look at how these uh, in various parts of the body how various activities can be modeled and what would be the effect on the internal forces. Yes. Can I voluntarily flex my muscles while doing work such that the three muscles exert is that amount that is somewhere around that? Um, so, that is a good question. There is some you know your in many cases your body performs the work and the objective appears to be based on various studies like for if you take walking for instance. Most of us walk at a specific speed which is, which we are comfortable with. Now, that comfort comes from the fact it uh, it has been shown that that comfort correlates to a minimal metabolic cost. So, our body is programmed to accomplish tasks such that you are consuming minimum energy whether you can voluntarily you know groups of muscles that that may be something that falls under the purview of the neural system you may have to look at the neuromechanics to say okay can i voluntarily exert forces in only these two muscles to perform a particular task i don't know the direct answer to that question but it may be something that has probably been looked into in research and if you are interested you can go look up some papers okay okay so we looked at the forearm the next portion that we will look at is we will look at a static analysis at the shoulder joint so a lot of activities that we do involves you know holding our arms at specific positions and perhaps carrying a load in that uh, even if you are not carrying a load, I could just have my arm outstretched like this and that would still be acting on my arm, right. Uh, so, you have this uh, policeman holding a stop sign at an intersection. We have lots of places where the signals do not work, right. And so, this guy has gotten the job today of holding up this stop sign. Now, there are various it up fairly high. So, it is seen from. So, you know he cannot just hold it like this tries to change his gesture so that he can still hold that sign and see and, and what we are going to do is compare these three situations. What does it do to the loading at the shoulder? So, that is the next exercise we are going to look at. 
So, we are looking at the static analysis. Again, if you think about the shoulder, you are looking at this deltoid muscle. So, if you had to pick one muscle, right, which we are which is what we are trying to do, which would be responsible for this action. What is what is this action at the shoulder? Abduction. So, I am abducting and what plane am I looking at? I am looking at the frontal plane. So, shoulder abduction in the frontal plane is what accomplishes that task. So, I would be interested in looking at the middle deltoid muscle, which is going to which I am going to assume is the only muscle acting for this particular purpose. Okay. So, I have this and let us say because the angle is changing, let me call this angle theta. The theta is which the angle of shoulder abduction, the angle which the arm makes with the vertical. I will take that as theta. Okay. So, we know that the shoulder is a ball and socket joint and there is actually um, you have various movements that are analysis, we are going to look at abduction in the frontal plane. So, if you look at this case, let me spell out the. Uh, so, let us say this person's weight, person of weight equal to 700 Newton. I am assuming about 70 kgs, uh, uh, an average man about 70 kgs is holding up the stop sign. Um, the weight of the stop sign, the weight of the load, let me say it is 0.01 times the weight of the person. W is 700 and 7 Newton meaning it is about 700 grams, the stop sign is about 700 grams. Okay. So, it is not a very heavy load, but, um, but we will see uh, what kind of loads it is, what kind of loads it generates. So, you and let us say that the elbow is extended. So, we are not looking at the elbow joint now. So, we are considering this entire system, the entire arm as the system of interest, because we are now interested in what is happening at the shoulder joint. Okay. So, we are assuming that the elbow is extended. In. So, this is an extended and what other information do I need? So, I am again performing a planar analysis, the stental plane. Okay. I know okay, this is point zero one. Sorry, sorry, this is point zero five. So I am given I draw the free body diagram if I isolate this. So in the frontal plane, essentially the shoulder is a hinge joint. I am assuming this is so I will not even consider this joint here because it is kept extended and those are all internal forces that are keeping it extended. So, I am not concerned, concerned about them in this. So, I have the weight of the load, let us say it is acting at the middle at this distance 0.2. Uh, so, this person the height of the person equal to 1.75 meters. Okay. And let us say the arm weighs 0 0.05 times the body weight of the person, this entire arm. Okay. And initially the person, I have the muscle And 
and let us say that the muscle insertion angle okay, muscle force is acting at an angle of 30 degrees to the arm. Okay, so, the insertion angle the angle the line of pull is at 30 degrees to the arm that angle is 30 degrees. What other forces do I have? I have joint reactions. So, I have a J x and a J y acting at this joint. So, this is the simplest model one muscle force I am assuming this is like a hinge. So, okay, so those are the assumptions I am making and I am also given you these distances. So, the muscle insertion point the load is acting at a distance. Now, I want you to calculate I should have done this before okay. write down the equations and calculate the unknowns. F m j x and j y. My equations are sigma f x equal to 0, sigma f y equal to 0 and sigma m about the shoulder equal to 0, because then I can eliminate j x and j y. So, if I do that j x minus f m sorry cos 30 equal to 0, there are no other forces in the x direction. I have j y plus f m sin 30 minus 0.05 w minus 0.01 w equal to 0 and the third equation is the horizontal component of the muscle force does not contribute. I only have f m sin 30 into 0 0.08 h minus 0 0.05 w into 0 0.2 h minus 0 anybody in terms of w yeah fine you can give me 245 newtons ok. So, I get f m equals 35 percent of w which is 245 I generally substitute only at the end. So, because it is easier to then compare and then j x Two one two point two newtons and J Y is minus eighteen point straightforward. Now So, this the muscle is ex exerting a force that is about 35 percent of the person's body weight which is fairly high 
force the muscle is exerting and after a while the person finds it hard to keep it in this extended position and slowly the arm kind of sags. Okay. The person brings that load closer to the midline of the body. 